Good afternoon. Welcome to Assembly Natural Resources. Madam Secretary, please take the roll. Assemblywoman Anderson? Present. Assemblywoman Bilbray Axelrod? Here. Assemblywoman Brown May? Here. Assemblywoman Considine? Present. Assemblyman DeLong? Present. Assemblywoman Duran? Here. Assemblyman Gurr? Here. Assemblywoman Hansen? Here. Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch? Here. Assemblyman Watts? Here. Assemblyman Urick? Here. Chair Cohen? And I am present. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Some housekeeping before we begin. Uh, please make sure all electronic devices are silenced. Uh, please make sure that all amendments and exhibits, things like that, are provided <coughs> for the committee a day, a business day prior to the hearing at noon. Uh, make sure there are 15 copies for guests. Also, uh, we may not agree on everything in the committee, but we do expect for there to be courtesy in the committee. Uh, please note that committee members will be using electronic devices throughout the committee. Please do not take this as a sign of disrespect, just that we're using our electronic devices to communicate and to review exhibits and the like. Um, we will also have public comment after the hearings. Uh, but with that, we will begin uh, PK O'Neill Day in Natural Resources. So with that, uh, Minority Leader, I believe we're going to go in order and start with Assembly Bill 325. So I will open up the hearing on Assembly Bill 325, which revises provisions relating to water. So please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate having this day. I got to tell you, in my three sessions, this is probably the first time I have ever testified or come in contact with Nat Ram. So um, I, I don't know whether to start out begging for mercy or just see how life goes, but I guess we'll just see. It's Monday. Um, as I was saying, thank you, Chair Cohen and members of the Committee of Natural Resources. For the record, I'm P.K. O'Neill, Assemblyman, representing District 40, which includes Carson City, all of Carson City, all of Story County, and the eastern side of Washoe County, along the Reno city limits up to the city limits of Sparks. Um, I'm here today to present to you Assembly Bill 325 for your consideration. The bill relates to water rights that are within the boundaries of an irrigation project within federal reclamation projects. The bill provides some exceptions from current requirements regarding temporary changes to the place of diversion, place of use, or manner of use of a water right and the state engineer's mapping filling requirements or filing requirements, I apologize, where certain specific circumstances exist. For a little background, during campaign and after election, I was speaking with a variety of constituents, including several ranchers from Lyon and Churchill County on water issues. One topic that has come forward is the duplicity which now exists with their individuals within the Truckee Carson Irrigation District, also known as TCID, having to complete two sets of paperwork, one with the Division of Water Resources and one with, for TCID. This bill hopefully will eliminate the duplication and allow the Division of Water Resources to focus on the issues that only they can resolve and expedite their services to their customers, our constituents. Today with me, helping me with this, I have Ben Shawcroft, General Manager of TCID, and Diane Bailey, the Mapping and Water Rights Specialist to TCID, to assist in the presentation and answer questions. With your permission, Chair, I would like to have them give an opening statement, and afterwards I will go through the bill itself. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, as stated, my name is Ben Shawcroft, the General Manager of the Truckee Carson Irrigation District. Uh, I'm also accompanied by Diane Bailey, who is our Mapping and Water Rights uh, Specialist. We are here to help introduce AB 325. And if we have questions, I'm really going to be referring to Ms. Bailey here because she really is our in-house expert on these issues. Currently, if you own water rights within the district, 
and you want to temporarily move that water to another piece of ground within the district, you must file an application for a temporary transfer with the state engineer. TCID provides a service to its users where we will review these applications prior to being filed with the state engineer. We do this to help the user ensure that the application is prepared properly with supporting documentation and maps so that the application does not get rejected by the state engineer. In the end, this saves time and money for the user. Now, these temporary transfers should be a quick and convenient way for the user to move water around in a given year to make the best use of their water. The problem, however, is that the review process at the state engineer's office is taking much too long to be of real benefit to the user. It makes it difficult for the user to plan their season, not knowing when or if their application will be approved. It is our understanding that this is largely due to the limited staff and resources at the state engineer's office that can be directed to these types of applications. This bill removes the requirement that such applications be reviewed by the state engineer and provides that they only be reviewed and approved by the irrigation district. And this only applies, again, to an irrigation district within a federal reclamation project, Truckee Carson Irrigation District. It makes sense to do this because TCID has the historical records and maps on which these applications rely. And we can process them much more quickly than what is being done by the state engineer. Ultimately, this will be a benefit to the user and it will be done at a lower cost. As such, we ask that you support AB 325 and we're happy to answer any questions. Ms. Bailey, do you do you have any prepared statements or are you just here for questions? I'm just here in case you have any questions. Okay, and um, Mr. Showcroft, are you, so I'm sorry, I want to make sure I understood what you said. So are you saying that this irrigation district, the Truckee Carson, is the only one within a federal, this is the only one at issue? It's the only one within a federal um, district? That's correct, in the, in the state of Nevada, correct. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, committee, do we have any questions? I, and I uh, apologize, Madam Chair. I believe that uh, Assemblyman uh, next to me was going to continue with uh, uh, going through the bill before. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Please. No, no. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Minority Leader. I jumped to the question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I also want to add, too, before we go into the bill itself, that this just deals, and if I state mis please correct me, this will just deal with surface waters not uh, groundwater, correct? So, With that said, Chair, I'd like to go through the bill as best as I can, as quickly as I can, so we can get to the real meat and the questions and answers. Uh, section 1, subsection 2, provides that a person is not required to file an application with the state engineer for a temporary change of the point of diversion manner of use or place of use for water already appropriated if the temporary change occurs within the boundaries of an irrigation district within a federal reclamation project, the irrigation district approves the temporary change, and the temporary change does not exceed one year. <coughs> Section 1, subsection 3 provides an exception to the state engineer's map requirements and provides that the state engineer may accept a map that does not conform to the regular requirements if the map is filed in connection with an application to appropriate water or to change the point of diversion, manner of use, or place of use of water subject to control of an irrigation district within a federal reclamation project and the irrigation district has approved the map. And I think that's it. And now you may see why I don't come to Nat Ram that often, Chair. <laughs> so with that being said, I'd like to have questions and answers. Hopefully the answers more than the questions. Thank you for that. And where, where do we know in this that it's just surface water? Is it, is it in there? Is it because we're in we're in the surface water chapter? Yeah. Okay. Yes. PK, I'm yep. sorry, PK or me in the chapter dealing with just surface water. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay, so with that we will go to a question from Assemblymember Watts. Mm. 
Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Good to see you, uh, Minority Leader. Um, so this is a question that will sound familiar to many of my, my colleagues. Um, but uh, I guess, first off, Mr. Shawcroft, could you talk a little bit about, uh, just go back to those timelines that you're seeing? So under the current process with the state engineer, what are, what are the timelines that you're seeing and what are the ideal timelines that maybe you've seen in the past or would like to see for the processing of these uh, applications? Uh, ben Shawcroft for the record, so I will actually defer this one to Ms. Bailey next to me uh, as she deals with these on a regular basis. For the record, Diane Bailey. Um, over the years, um, we had uh, some people at the state that were had more time to deal with this stuff, so the time frames were a little little less than what we're doing now, but um, it's really difficult, I guess, for them to dedicate the time they need now for, for some of these temporaries, and some of them are fairly complicated. Um, once upon a time, I mean, we could, in an emergency situation, get a temporary transfer through within a couple of weeks, but now it's taking months and months, and the problem is um, that, uh, you know, the farmers are trying to plan whether or not they're going to have this water where they need it to be. And um, so the extra time is causing some problems. And uh, we do do a lot of the work ourselves at TCID, the applications mapping, helping the, the water users with those. So, um, you know, we, we do have all the records, all the maps, and um, we have dealt extensively with our people at the state and uh, we have a very good uh, rapport with them so I believe you know we could continue on basically the same way we're doing just a little quicker that's all thank you um, thank you for that so uh, I guess my next question is so I, it sounds like this is something that also kind of comes along um, with the Kind of with the seasonal cycle. So, are there is there a potential situation where you may have a particular user filing uh, in multiple years for these um, these temporary changes to um, the, these change applications? Um, they we do have water users that f file pretty much every year, depending on the circumstance, um, and. Uh, um, but sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're just enough different that the state has to do a more extensive review and it does take time. Thank you. And then is there anything in this bill that would have information on the decisions made by the irrigation district be shared with the state engineer's office? Ben Shawcroft for the record. Yeah, our plan is to actually put into process a, a procedure or policy where um, once TCID has reviewed it and approved it, then we provide notice to uh, the state engineer's office because it could potentially impact uh, another application with their office for a permanent transfer. Thank you, and I don't see that in statute, so I'd, I'd like to uh, see some, some uh, work to get that fleshed out. And uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, for the indulgence on the questions. And uh, to, to your request, uh, Assemblyman O'Neill, I do have an answer, and it's more staff for the Division of Water Resources. I'll second, P.K. O'Neill, I'll second that one, <laughs> Assemblyman Watts. Okay. Uh, Assemblymember Urich. Thank you, Chair. Um, once again, I find myself fascinated at these water policies, and as a freshman here trying to learn all about this, I usually really try to take advantage of any opportunity that I have to meet individuals like you in advance of the hearing so I can establish a framework that I will confess at this moment I do not have. And so I was going to ask if it's possible, and if it's more timely, um, I'd be happy to meet with you afterwards because we're asking for an exception to something that I, to a process that I don't fully understand. So if you can kind of help me understand um, here, if you could do it in a shortened time frame, uh, kind of this federal reclamation project, uh, as well as the interplay with the irrigation district and the state engineer and the original permitting process and who is making what decisions based on what, and therefore kind of taking the state engineer out of this 
exemption or you know for this application for a temporary change to understand if it would even be appropriate if we're going to be missing some sort of step in there so again i apologize for my own ignorance on this but if you can explain that shortly if it's going to be long you can tell me toby i'll meet you afterwards thank you uh, ben shawcroft for the record it, it, it is a bit of a complex answer and, and i would hate to also state something incorrectly as i'm uh as i try to explain it but um and, but what we have is the uh the the Federal Reclamation did the project itself, which was um, created in 1902, uh, so a very long time ago. And the water then was then was uh, made available to the users, and the users still own the water rights. But the but the Bureau of Reclamation they own the facility, so they own the facility. The Truckee Carson Irrigation District we maintain and operate the facilities. Uh, and the water users own the water rights. Uh, and so that's, so you have a lot of different layers here that's also governed by uh, federal court decrees, such as the Alpine decree, the Ordnitch decree on the different river systems. Uh, so we, so there's, there's that, and that, that's managed and governed by uh, uh, federal water master and by the uh, federal district court. So you have that, and then you have the layer of uh, Nevada state water rights and water law that governs the use of, of, of that resource within the state of Nevada. And so there, there is that kind of interplay between the two. Uh, the nuances, in this, it kind of depends on the situation that we're talking about as far as which govern, governs state law versus uh, you know, federal law or the decrees. Um, we'd, ha we'd have to get into a... a probably much longer discussion that we can get into today but uh, there is that interplay and in, in most cases we're able to figure that out as to which governs because there's a, a case law that addresses a lot of those issues assembly member LaRue Hatch thank you madam chair and I think it surprises no one that I have a few questions so my first question is obviously this applies to one district in one place in the state, are other users, other farmers or ranchers applying to the state water engineer for these temporary changes? Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, ben Schrocker, for the for the record, yes, I, I you know applications for temporary transfers of water are taking all uh, taking place all the time among all the different various bases w basins within the state of Nevada. Uh, so we're not unique in that regard, um, but since TCID uh, is unique in that all of the water that makes it to our project is then governed by uh, our rules and regulations and OCAP and different things that that it's then treated a little bit differently uh, than than your standard user throughout the state of Nevada. So follow up if I may. So if other people are doing this and the problem is that your one district has an extra burden couldn't this be easily solved by you matching your paperwork to the state water engineer instead of changing all of this for an exemption for one single basin? Yeah, ben Shockroff, for the record. Yeah, the, pro the problem we've identified is that um, TCID has probably, I, we say the best records available for the water rights and the maps um, for our irrigation district. And therefore, that's really what we rely on. That's what we look at primarily to de make these determinations. Uh, and so having both entities look at it, we've, we, we identify certain conflicts sometimes, um, which in our opinion should be resolved in favor of the Tr Truckee Carson Irrigation District records because those are the historical records. Um, I, I, I don't know, did that answer your question? I, there's. Anyway, and maybe you can maybe state it again if I missed something there. Yeah, I think I was just asking if the process is so burdensome, instead of changing NRS, which will affect everybody, couldn't you just fix the burden within your district? I will try that. Sure. <laughs> Diane Bailey, for the record. Um, we've, I've, just for the record, I've been at TCID for 35 years, so... Um, I have dealt with many aspects of the state, and we've, I've gone through quite a few different employees of the state, and um, we've always worked together very well and tried to work through our issues and, and things, um, but it has gotten to the point now where uh, it's just, it's very burdensome for the state 
to, um, there, there's, I guess, I'm not my understanding, there's not enough uh, staff there. There's one gentleman right now trying to deal with our stuff plus uh, his other <laughs> part of his job and he's, he's really having a difficult time trying to get these permits issued in a timely manner. Um, we do follow all the steps. We do apply, you know, the applications and everything, but because again of all these records and the detail, our, our project is, is much more detailed than a lot of other projects. So, I mean, we're down to hundreds of an acre and tiny little pieces and map shifts and things. And this gentleman is, he's having a really hard time keeping up with his. So we're, we're trying to not only alleviate our part of it, but also the state's part of it for something that is really not shouldn't be that difficult and it's only for one year it's temporary you know at the end of the year it reverts back to where it was and um, it just it's a lot of work for something for such a very short period of time it's taking up a lot of people's time that probably isn't necessary and if i may chair pk o'neill putting it in short we're going to simplify so the state engineer can deal with those other people. That's the intent of this bill, is to provide better service to our customers, our constituents. TCID will take care of their immediate areas of responsibilities, allowing the state engineer to take care of everybody else's. So, as was stated earlier, the ranchers want to get to their fields as quickly and know that they have water and that they can move their water around in an expeditious time period and not have to wait two, three months plus when actually the growing season is coming to an end. So we're actually, we're trying to, in the intent of this bill, is to simplify and provide better services of the government. And I just have one more, if I may. Thank you. Uh, so it sounds like we are all of us in agreement that the state water engineer is overtaxed. And so hopefully we all support getting them more staff members so that they can do the work that they need to do. I, I do, um, have some concerns over a lack of oversight, especially when it comes to water, which is, you know, our most precious resor resource here in Nevada. I, I know you mentioned to my colleague that some of these users file annually for a change. And so what I want to know is with this new language, if they just file a permit that says it's for one year only, can they come back every single year and say it's for one year only? And in result, we get a permanent change that's never been reviewed by the state water engineer. P.K. O'Neill, the answer to that, and correct me, is yes, but every year it has to be approved and reviewed. So it doesn't become an automatic, they just can't do it without seeking to TCID, TCID. And TCID looks as their water as one of the most valuable resources that we have, and these ranchers look at it too, both in the sh good years and in those drought years that we've experienced. So, so yeah, the answer is yes, they can come back, but every year that application has to go through the same process again and again. So what is the longest or the most number of years that someone has received temporaries? For the record, Diane Bailey. Um, we have... Uh, we have some people that are are multiple years. I mean, we could um, 10, 15 years in some case. But again, you'd have to understand how things work. Uh, we have a lease. We have people that lease water from other people. Um, th there's very there's there's very limited water, as we all know, and. Um, it's not readily available to be purchased and transferred on a permanent basis, whereas some farmers are willing to lease to somebody on a temporary basis. And in some cases, it, it, is, it is multiple years. Um, TCID, I guess the word is sponsors a tr temporary transfer every year uh, using county water that um, the county does not have a use for at this point and it puts it to beneficial use every year. It's a yearly uh, transfer. 
and uh, there is no, uh, there's not going to be any permanent transfer ever for this water unless the county does it for themselves. So, but it does keep that valuable resource in production and it helps the farmers. But uh, so, so a lot of this water is lease water, I guess you'd say, um, and, and no means to do a permanent transfer. Yeah. Okay, and then, so we know the state engineer's office, or we've heard the state engineer's office is overtaxed right now, but how, how long would you say this has been an issue uh, for your customers? Um, well, I mean, it's always been an issue as far as just trying to make sure we can get a permit issued um, in a timely manner when the farmers need the water. Um, it has become more of an issue um, within the last five years or so. Um, there was a gentleman at the state that dedicated quite a, was able to dedicate quite a bit of his time to our plight, so to speak. And um, when he left, then it's kind of been difficult to uh, to get a have a person that was that dedicated to what we need. And it's and it's in the spring. You know, um, it's not all year, but it um, it does put a burden on the state to, to try to, to get our stuff through just that short of a time frame. That's, does that answer the question? All right, committee, do we have any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we're going to move on to support. Um, so, unless there was, Anything else you wanted to add? Less is more, Chair. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we're going to move on to support in Carson City. There's three chairs. So um, as people move out of the chairs, feel free to fill in the chairs. And then I'm assuming there's no one in Las Vegas unless anyone's hiding or uh, in Elko. Um, but so... Anyone in Carson City in support, come on up. Okay, seeing none and seeing no one in Elko or Las Vegas, if we can go to the phones, please, BPS. Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers at this time. Okay, so with that, we will go to opposition in Carson City. And same thing with fill in the chairs as you go. And we do have a bit of a time crunch because we have to go back to the floor at some point. So we're going to time for two minutes. So whichever one of you would like to go first, please go ahead. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman. Uh, for the record, my name is Steve Walker, representing Eureka County, kind of home away from home. The uh, first, Assemblyman O'Neill's uh, statement that it was surface waters only needs to be codified into the bill. Uh, and there are, there are, are other water rights that are not under the jurisdiction of the district. I know I had one and uh, it uh, has been sold to Churchill County. So we feel we needed to make sure that it's dis to surface water rights. Also, uh, there would be a suggestion uh, to section two, line six, uh, uh, excuse me, section two, sub one, and that is the temporary change occurs within the boundaries of the district. We would suggest that should be jurisdiction, jurisdiction of the district. Also an explanation of the manner of use change. A manner of use change in water typically would go something like agriculture, the medicinal, and industrial. Uh, I'm assuming, uh, having lived in Fallon, that the manner of use changes are basically where you're pumping uh, out of the canal to water your lawn as a quasi-municipal, but I think some, uh, some explanation of that uh, might be necessary. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Kyle. I'm sorry, Mr. Rorick, Mr. Walker. I'm sorry, yeah, Mr. Walker. Um, so with, the, besides that, are you still, are you supporting the bill otherwise? No, no, I actually, the bill, I'm speaking in opposition only so I can uh, try to put our concerns into the bill. If they're accepted, we would uh, either, we would be neutral or support of the bill. Okay. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. And thank you for coming in, in opposition per the court, uh, per the committee rules. 
I'm sorry, please go ahead. It's okay. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Kyle Rohrink with the Great Basin Water Network. We oppose AB 325. We know there are lots of farmers out there who, uh, who keep good records, and they would also like uh, exemptions from, from NRS. And I think this could just become a slippery slope where we could have people lining up year after year saying, hey, we want an exemption, we want an exemption. So I think that's just something to be uh, uh, concerned about. Um, I think we also... Uh, uh, have to take into consideration what many of you have said is that this is about funding DWR and you know I think we we really all need to be getting on the bandwagon and not changing statute because some of those issues we need to be just doing the work and, and have consistency so uh, thank you for allowing me a moment to lobby on that front and uh, I appreciate your time thank you Thank you, Madam Chair. Patrick Donnelly with the Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, this is not the first bill this committee has heard where someone has said the state engineer's office is not able to respond in a timely fashion, so we need to change the law. Um, that does not seem like the appropriate response to uh, delays in action from the state engineer's office. It seems like they need more personnel. And, you know, to read briefly from the NRS 533.025, water belongs to the public. The water of all sources of water supply within the boundaries of the state, whether above or beneath the surface of the ground, belongs to the public. The state engineer is the public's agent for administering that water. This bill would transfer the jurisdiction and authority over water, over the public's water, within a given area uh, to local control. Uh, while locals should have input on the management of water, that water is within the jurisdiction of the state and must remain that way. Uh, so we must oppose this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Will Adler representing Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe, for the record. Uh, Pyramid Lake would have to come in in opposition on uh, AB uh, 325 as well, just because uh, the, the premise of the law or the, the bill being proposed is, is trying to, you know, solve a symptom of something that isn't related to the, the bill itself, which is, again, we're hearing uh, the lack of staffing of the state engineer's office. But uh, Pyramid Lake in particular would have to oppose this bill because uh, previous change applications and previous water right uses, specifically in the Truckee River and in some of these restricted basins as we're speaking to, uh, specifically the Newlands project, uh, have, have already been uh, deeded against by Pyramid Lake and actually had their water rights uh, put into question or noticed, uh, but we, we wouldn't have any notification of these change applications or how this process would work if this went forward because the temporary change applications go forward without any notification whether they were in compliance with state law or they did violate previous water rights or the senior water rights chain that we see in this uh, layer cake here. But again, uh, we would be supportive of some way to do sort of a quick change application or some documented way to get into the state engineer's office to relieve some of these symptoms for continual change applications and such like that. But the lack of documentation, the lack of touching the state at all uh, in this process would leave us out of the loop or not be able to know what is going on in our backyard, uh, as per, per said. But uh, thank you for hearing me today, and sorry for the opposition. Okay, seeing no one else for opposition in Carson City, seeing no one in Las Vegas or Elko, BPS, we'll go to the phones, please. Chair, there are no callers at this time. Okay, with that, we will go to neutral. Please go ahead. Adam Sullivan, for the record, um, Nevada State Engineer. So this is, we are testifying neutral on this. It, it, this, is a, this is a good concept, and I want to walk through, or make a couple points about why TCID um, is, is really a special case. We have been working co cooperatively with TCID on this issue over a number of years of how to, how to streamline what we do as a state engineer's office, what TCID does, and what we need to do to, to um, be, to, to do our job for the water users. I do appreciate the recognition that the state engineer's office is, is limited in staff, both from the question and, and from the testimony. But in this case, this is what we do for TCID um, mapping and temporary change apps is something that we is really, uh, we spend a lot of time on small discrepancies in mapping, in the mapping that we have versus the mapping that TCID has. And, and that's where the, that's what we're trying to address here. Rather, it's, it's, 
it's that's the problem and as far as um, um, well, well let me move on an important point here is that TCID as the only federal uh, irrigation district in the state um, has this the special rule and without going into it in, in much detail to, to make this change would make would allow them to operate just like all the other irrigation districts within the state, and it's kind of one of the purposes for an irrigation district, that once that surface water enters the district, they have some authority and responsibility to move the water around within the district for efficiency as needed. Um, and um, so th this would allow TCID to, to work just like all other irrigation districts in the state. Um, Sorry, I have a lot of scribble notes from the, from the testimony, and, and I'll just make um, a, a couple points. From, from my perspective, this, this bill would, um, there would still maintain the appropriate level of oversight, both from the, from the state um, as well as from the Bureau of Reclamation, and it could be done within the terms of the, the decrees that govern water distribution um, for TCID. Um, and it's something that um, would add, it would reduce redundancy and uh, would add government efficiency. Thank you. It, w one quick addition is that temporary change applications that we're talking about are not published in the ordinary way that, that permanent change applications are, are published, just to clear up some of the earlier discussion. Okay. So, okay. Is that, so are you, does that have to do with um, the notice? Or with? Good evening, Micheline Fairbank for the record. So yes, yeah, so um, current law and current statute provides that temporary applications, so those applications that are for one year or less are not required to be published unless the state engineer makes a finding that it implicates the public interest. So as a matter of course, these change applications that we have within the Truckee Carson Irrigation District, they're just, a lot of times they're just movements between farm units, um, a lot of other just kind of unique things that happen within irrigation districts all throughout Nevada, whether you're talking about the Walker River Irrigation District, Pershing County Irrigation District, Muddy, um, the um, Muddy River, so so those typically aren't published. So it doesn't this legislation doesn't change the status of how things are typically done. What it does is just basically does what we said is it provides TCID on that equal footing as all the other irrigation districts, that they're managing the water within their district and we're not having to sign off on every change um, because we do have these discrepancies on mapping and so it does become a very time consuming process um, that is, is onerous for all everyone involved. Thank you for that, Ms. Fairbanks. Hold on just a moment. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just as a point of clarification, I think if you could make sure the way I heard this is correct, every irrigation district manages the water within that district without doing change applications to the state engineer except for the Newlands project. Micheline Fairbank, for the record, yes. And therefore, this change would just make the Newlands project managed the same way as all the other irrigation districts. Adam Sullivan, for the record, to a certain extent, yes, there's there are still some different processes, but because of it, the federal side, because yeah. it's a federal district, because yeah. of the way the ownership of individual water rights are, but those are things that we could still work with, and uh, this would make it more similar, and um, to other irrigation districts in the state. Okay, thank you both for answering questions. I don't think we have any other questions, so thank you. Anyone else for neutral and seeing none in Las Vegas or 
Elko, BPS, if we could go to the phones, please. Chair, there are no callers at this time. Okay, with that, I will invite the majority leader back up for any closing statements. Chair, first of all, I want to thank you. I think you just called me the majority leader. <laughs> Drink that. <laughs> That really brought everybody to a certain awake. Um, Chair, in closing, I just want to say a couple things. First of all, I appreciate the last clarification from our water master or water engineer and that this is actually bringing TCID somewhat on equal footing to the other water districts. Second, I want to say I'm very disappointed in those that spoke in opposition. I have an open door policy. It's amazing how some of the lobbyists that spoke today just a few minutes ago, have been in my office recently talking about other issues and never once brought this up, any of their issues up to me. So to be sort of um, bushwhacked on it is upsetting, but I am still willing and I invite them to come back into the office at any time to discuss, to hammer it out and see if we can find common ground to make a good bill even better. As to the one question on the codification of water rights, I would offer to legal to answer the question since it's in the chapter that deals with surface waters, why would it have to be codified again if it's in that chapter would be my question to legal to answer. Otherwise, I really appreciate the time and I think we'll be seeing more of each other real soon. <laughs> Thank you, Minority Leader. And with that, we will close out the hearing on Assembly Bill 325, and we will open the hearing on Assembly Bill 349, which establishes the Nevada Wildlife Conservation Program. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. Chair Cohen and committee members. Just to remind you, I'm P.K. O'Neill, Assembly District 40 representative. <clears throat> I'm here today to present to you Assembly Bill 349 for your consideration. The bill establishes the Nevada Wildlife Conservation Program. Nevada is blessed with an abundance of wildlife, and this bill will help us manage wildlife and wildlife habitat for future generations to enjoy. The genesis of this bill came about from a conversation I recently had with a fellow Assemblyman Toby York of AD 19 and Assemblyman Howard Watts of AD 15 and their desires to address some of the issues dealing with habitats and the some of the what cumbersome process that we have going forward. Um, I have with me today, uh, it's, you may recognize him, former Senator Chris Brooks, who will be assisting me, and I would like for him to give a few statements before I actually go into the bill itself. We like to think of him as former Assemblyman Chris Assembly. Brooks, but I, please I, sorry go about ahead. That. Hey, if I'm a majority leader, he can be Senator. <laughs> uh, thank you, Assemblyman O'Neill, and thank you, uh, Chair Cohen and members of the Natural Resources Committee. It, I'm Chris Brooks, for the record, and a, a Senior Vice President of Aravia Power and former member of this wonderful committee and former member of this body and former colleague in the assembly of Assemblyman O'Neill. Wonderful to be here. Um, I, I, I wanna thank uh, Assemblyman Urich and Assemblyman Watts for um, uh, helping kind of facilitate the introduction of this bill with, with Assemblyman O'Neill. I, I feel that there's a great need for, for this particular mechanism. Um, I come to this, this, this subject um, from a couple of different places. Uh, as the former chair of Senate Finance and as a former member of, of the Senate and Assembly Natural Resources Committees, I saw this issue, and as a former chair of uh, Interim Finance Committee as well, I saw some of the, um, the difficulties in, in facilitating uh, the funding of habitat and wildlife conservation and habitat conservation in our state. But it really, it really came to light um, when I, I left the, the legislature and to rejoin my um, private um, industry that I had spent the last 30 years in, and that's energy, when we are developing huge projects across the state of Nevada. And renewable energy, traditional energy, mining, 
pipelines, transmission lines, um, are, are using tremendous amounts of, of land, public lands across the state of Nevada, and have impacts on wildlife habitat and on the wildlife in our state, and have very few mechanisms by which they can um, mitigate some of those impacts. And so uh, a lot of other states, and, and hopefully um, Deputy Director um, uh, Goshert can maybe speak to this, but a lot of other states have these accounts that they've set up. And they work sort of like similar to an endowment account, where industries such as the industry I'm in, and that's the renewable energy uh, development and construction industry, can, can identify um, uh, opportunities to make contributions to the, the conservation of habitat and wildlife in our state and can contribute to a fund. And then that fund can have an independent body that then determines in, with uh, uh, the Department of Wildlife on how habitat and habitat and, and actual uh, wildlife and the wildlife habitat can be protected and enhanced in our great state. And currently, we, th there is not really a mechanism by which to do that. You have to have identify an exact project, an exact dollar amount, and then work that through the Department of Wildlife and then through the, um, the money committees and, and have that fund one project. Um, I think what we in the industry and I think what we in Nevada would be best served by is by having an account by which um, industries can contribute their monies too, and then it can then be, uh, it can grow like an endowment and create long-term projects, very flexible um, funding for long-term projects for mitigation um, and for habitat improvement in the state of Nevada. And so this, I think, is a great example of a way that it could be done. And um, I am glad that, that, you know, I, that this got brought forward. And I, I worked with our former director um, in, of, of wildlife and a former deputy director of the Department of Wildlife and also approached um, President Sandoval at the University of Nevada, Reno, about a concept similar to this. And it was already operating in parallel with our, our former directors of the Department of Wildlife. And to see the, the new director, um, Alan uh, Janay, take this up as well as his deputy, uh, it's, it's really, I think it's an incredibly uh, important and yet a, a wonderful opportunity. And, and just to kind of put this into to scale, the scope and scale, there are tens of billions of dollars in just the next few years of energy, transmission, mineral development, and, and renewable energy development that are happening, that will take place in the state of Nevada. And I think it is, it is, it is urgent and imperative that our state come up with a mechanism by which they can take full advantage of that energy development and of that, that transmission and development in our state and to the benefit of wildlife and habitat for, for future generations in our state. And, and it's coming whether we have a way to, to take advantage of it or not. And as, uh, and as a representative of my company who's in that industry, um, I think that we are looking for ways that we can help the habitat and the wildlife in our state. So thank you. Chair, with your PK O'Neill, Chair, with your permission, I'll go through the bill itself now. Thank you. There are only six sections to this seven-page bill, so I would like to walk the committee through the bill section by section. Section one makes a conforming change to provide that money received by Nevada Department of Wildlife for the Nevada Wildlife Conservation Program account is not required to be deposited in the wildlife account in the state general fund. Section two simply provides for the addition of section three and four of the bill to chapter 502 licensing tags and permits of the Nevada Refined Statute or NRS. Section three creates the Nevada Wildlife Conservation Program account in the state general fund and establishes the Nevada Wildlife Conservation Program to support the preservation, protection, management, and restoration of wildlife and wildlife habitats in this state. The bill requires the Department of Wildlife to administer the program and authorizes, but does not require the department to contract with the Community Foundation of Northern Nevada to assist in the administration of the program, including, without limitation, the collection of donations for the program. In addition to any direct legislative appropriation, the department may apply for and accept any gift, grant, bequest, or donation for deposit in the account 
and use by the program. The bill allows donors to the program to remain anonymous if they so prefer. The money in the account must be used in accordance with any recommendation of the board of the Nevada Wildlife Conservation Program, including but not limited to providing matching funds as a condition of any federal grant related to the preservation, protection, management, and restoration of wildlife and wildlife habitats. The department is required to submit a report on or before February 1st of each year to the Interim Finance Committee, IFC, concerning the native wildlife, the, I'm sorry, the Nevada Wildlife Conservation Program account, including without limitation, A, the number of donations and total value of each donation during the immediate preceding calendar year, B, the total amount of any grants of money received by the department for deposit in the account during the immediate preceding calendar year, C, the total amount of money received by the program, the amount of money expended from the account, and a description of each project for which the money was spent, and D, any recommendation concerning legislation to improve the program. <coughs> Moving to section four, originally the bill created a five member board of the Nevada Wildlife Cons Conservation Program. I've submitted an amendment that I have, should be up on Nellis by now. The amendment would reduce the number of board members from five to three, removing two members appointed by the legislative leadership. As you know, the larger the board, the more unwieldy it becomes. A smaller board would only reduce, also reduce costs for the board, anything associated with their activities. The board will be comprised of an appointee by the governor from a field related to management of wildlife. Another member of the board by the chairman of the Wildlife Commission with a background in rangeland or management of wildlife. The third member of the board will be the chair of the commission or a member of the commission appointed by the Wildlife Commission chair. Members of the board must be Nevada residents and will serve a term of two years. The board is charged with advising the department on the ex expenditure of money in the Nevada Wildlife Conservation Program account. And section four also sets forth certain parameters for the operation of the board at its first meeting of each year, the member of the board shall elect a chair who shall serve until the next chair is elected. The board shall meet as necessary at the call of the chair. A majority of the members of the board constitutes a quorum for the transaction of business and a majority of those members present at any meeting is sufficient for any official action taken by the board. While engaged in the business of the board to the extent of legislative appropriations, each member of the board is entitled to receive the per diem allowance and travel expenses provided for state officers and employees generally. Section five makes a conforming change to account for the confidentiality of personnel identifying information of certain donors to the program. Section six sets forth the effective date of July 1st, 2023. And that is it in its entirety for AB 349. And may I just add, Chair, on, I know this is a policy committee and normally you're not allowed to talk any financial impacts, but with your permission, I'd like to just make a short statement to it. Um, with that being, the, there is the current physical note from the Department of Wildlife was submitted. The note states that the department will be receiving revenue from the program However, the impact cannot be determined at this time. From my understanding and from my intent of the bill itself, the expenses of those three board members will be paid for out of the funds being contributed to the account. So there should be no direct impact to the Department of Wildlife. Additionally, and I think you'll hear from uh, people that come forward, I've got some friends here, believe it or not, that will speak in behalf that there are current um, employees of the Department of Wildlife that are handling other committees that are also could take this on. So with that said, um, Chair, I would be open to questions and answers. Well, we do have Ms. Renda on Zoom. Do you want us to go to her for any statements before questions? I think she is here for 
the part to be my one of my three friends to uh, call up for, uh, unless she would like to make a statement. Lauren, would you like to say anything? Since I'm, since I'm testifying in, in neutral for this uh, bill, I would, would just like to request that, yeah, I'm just called upon for questions um, as to the administration of the fund um, on behalf of the Community Foundation. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Ms. Renda. Okay, so with Thank that, you. I have a question from Assemblymember Watts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you very much for bringing the bill, uh, Assemblyman. You have plenty of friends. Sometimes we might rough house a little bit, but we're, uh, we're, we're friends, I hope. So um, uh, actually, one, the question I wanted to first ask is to uh, Mr. Brooks. Um, so you know, I appreciate some of the background that you provided on this. I remember when we served on interim finance committee together and had to deal with the constant items around uh, donations and grants to the Department of Wildlife, uh, including in severe drought situations, uh, other emergencies where those items were waiting for approval um, while wildlife were at risk and sportsmen groups were ready to go. Uh, the, mon the funds were there and uh, we became a, a hang up in the process and I believe we worked on some legislation, particularly around some of those emergency situations to try and prevent cases like that from happening in the uh, moving forward. I, I guess one of the things that I think about that you that you and I also have some experience with is um, the Clean Energy Fund or Green Bank. So it's a state created entity, but it's a nonprofit entity. So it has a board that's kind of prescribed in statute. But after that, it's not administered as another as most state budgets are it's kind of its own entity you can appropriate some funds you can have some reporting and some transparency back to the state but they have a little bit more autonomy when it comes to um, uh, any staffing some of the programmatic and being able to just take some of those donations and move money around without always having to come back to IFC so I guess I wanted to provide a little bit of context to members about kind of what some of those arrangements can look like, but to put it into a question, is that something that you kind of see is that it's using one of the alternative arrangements that we kind of have for setting up entities in the state that would provide the flexibility to receive donations without having to wait to allow some uh, you know, for anonymous donors to give contributions, et cetera? Uh, Chris Brooks, for the record, thank you, Assemblyman Watts. That's exactly the need. Um, the need, the need from a, the ability to be flexible and rapid, and and how you evolve conservation, habitat conservation, and wildlife conservation projects, but also the need to be able to accept, you know, um, sometimes anonymous donations and that. Uh, from donors and to have those be able to be accepted without necessarily having a program attached to them. And so I think both of those things, and, and you used the drought conditions, and we both saw that happen in real life, and it was you know, kind of frustrating and heartbreaking. Um, and um, this, I think, would alleviate that. And you use a good example of the, um, uh, the Clean Energy Fund, but also there's the, uh, the Dream Tags. I think is a, is a, a good analog as well of how this could work. Thank you for that. And then I think, so the concept is again, because this is kind of a separate entity that the community foundation would help do the administration of accepting those gifts of managing kind of the balances and, and do that interface work again. So that we don't have to figure out how we get a employee uh, kind of staffed up over there. So instead, there's a partnership with the Community Foundation where they basically will handle that administrative workload and, and kind of serve as a fiscal sponsor uh, and have kind of a fiscal sponsor type arrangement. I guess that might be for the Community Foundation. Is that is that kind of how um, the administration is envisioned? That would be correct, yes. So we would, um, you know, help administer any grants from the from the fund, we would help to accept any gifts to the fund, whether that would be from you know an, a, an entity or an individual. Um, 
so uh, the foundation being a 501c3 nonprofit ourselves, um, any fund established with us is also considered a charitable entity. So uh, any donations made to the fund um, would be uh, would qualify for charitable deductions. So you know we would provide um, gift letters for tax purposes, things like that. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And Ms. Renda, can you please spell your name for the record? Yes, of course. First name is Lauren, L-A-U-R-E-N. Last name, Renda, R-E-N-D-A. Thank you. And I have a question from Assemblymember Yurik. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to play on my colleague's uh, last question. Um, and certainly I can understand how that this program would is designed to bring in additional resources through anonymous donations and whatnot to make those resources more readily available to be more efficiently and timely distributed in times of need. Can you just help us understand kind of what the current timeline is now, for example, in the drought conditions that I know that you and Assemblyman Watts were referring to, what that typical timeline would be to get those resources where they needed to be and how this program would reduce that time frame and what that time frame might look like. Uh, thank you, Chris Brooks, for the record. I, I don't know exactly what goes into creating a work program, for instance, like when it, what it did to get to the place that it finally got to the, the, the money committees of the Nevada legislature. But once that happens, that process, if it is even approved to be on the agenda and brought forward, it could take months. And, um, and at, at, at least at the absolute best case scenario is a 30 day program. And, um, but a lot of that work, most of that work, already took place at the Nevada Department of Wildlife before it ever even got to, the, to that situation. So I see that we have the Nevada Department of Wildlife that just joined us that probably answered that question better on that end of it. Thank you. Jordan Goshert, for the record, Deputy Director with the Nevada Department of Wildlife. Um, so by the time we receive a donation, um, we have to meet the deadlines to get on the IFC which typically is a month or a month and a half before the IFC meeting. Um, and then we have to wait for IFC to approve it before we can spend it. So sometimes it is three months or more. Um, sometimes we don't meet that next IFC deadline, so then we're waiting to the one after that. So it could be quite a while. And thank you for that explanation. And I don't know if this would go to uh, our other uh, presenter here today, or, or the, uh, and I, I apologize, I forgot her name. Um, th what would we anticipate if a request came in under this sort of program, what that timeline could theoretically be reduced to, to deploy those resources more efficiently? Sure, so uh, under the Community Foundation Administration, um, we would, we run, Two grant cycles per year. However, we do have the ability to run emergency grant cycles. So basically, as soon as this proposed board or committee um, could review an emergency request uh, and either approve or deny it um, in full or in part, um, it takes about uh, about two weeks for us to get a, a check distribution out um, from the date that a grant is is approved. So it's um it's quite fast. Thank you, Ms. Renda. Okay, with that, I have a question from uh, Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for bringing this bill. I think it's an important one, and I appreciate that you are working on this. Um, so I have, I have a comment and then a question. So my comment is just on the makeup of the board. I actually liked it at five. I. I personally think three might be a little small, and I think that's as a history teacher. I don't think threes, whether we look at the Troika or the Triumvirate, ended well. So um, I think five is a, is a good number. But my question is on page three with the, the Community Foundation of Northern Nevada specifically. And I noticed that we are putting this foundation in statute, and so I wondered if you could just speak to one, why were they chosen specifically? And two, why do we need to name them specifically instead of just saying they may contract with a nonprofit? Uh, 
Jordan Goshert for the record. Uh, thank you for the question. We currently work with the Northern Nevada Community Foundation um, with the Dream Tag program, and it's very successful. Um, so we wanted to put their name in here as that we, we may contract with them. Um, the partnership with them has been great so far. And PK O'Neill, for the record, chair to you and through Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch about the reduction. Um, you know, I s respectfully submit this, and, and I go back to Assemblyman Watts. We joke around, we tumble a little bit. I arm wrestle with the speaker even. Um, not sure who won that arm wrestling contest, by the way. But I didn't want this bill or this committee to become political. Uh, currently, now, both, both houses have majority. They was appointed by the speaker, and then in the Senate are Democrat. I don't want the bill or the committee to become political in any fashion, form or fashion. Um, and that's why I was looking at that balance to remove them uh, from there. Plus, I, I've been on small committees, even in our um, State Ethics Commission, it was difficult sometimes to get the scheduling of our five to six members uh, that we needed to have a committee hearing. So, which was the other reason why I went, and I was looking at the expense. I don't want money going that people donate to do these worthwhile programs going to uh, the administration part of it. Uh, it's one thing I always look at before I donate money is what are the administrative costs versus what goes to the program itself. So I respectfully, I understand your position, but those are my reasonings for it currently. Thank you. So I'm actually gonna follow up to the, the Community Foundation. And so I recognize that they're a great partner. My question is if we put them in statute and then something happens and they don't exist anymore or they're less of a great partner for some reason, um, what is our recourse? Because now we have to wait for us to come back and then change that. Jordan Goshert, for the record. Um, I believe that's why the language in here says that we may contract with them, so we're really not obligated to do so, but if you guys feel that that needs a change, then we're open. Assembly Member Gurr. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Seems like a pretty broad definition of pre preservation, protection, management, and restoration of wildlife and wildlife habitats. What's the perceived use for these funds? What, are there any parameters? Or is it just somebody comes up with an idea and present it and have a grant and keep going? Kind of like the, the, the uh, predator control thing. People throw grants at it, is that, or, well that's my train of thought, excuse me. People come up with programs and then come to you to do it? Or is the department gonna set the parameters? This is Chris Brooks for the record. In conversations in our initial kind of thought process of what kind of led to the frustration, not frustration, that's probably not the best term, but the opportunities um, that would exist, um, all, all sorts of, of projects were envisioned. And I think it was, you know, from a, a guzzler for, for bighorn sheep to, uh, you know, a habitat at restoration, whether it be like pinion juniper um, uh, mitigation or uh, invasive species removal. Um, all the way to um, uh, actual like wildlife corridors and, and improvement of wildlife corridors for big game. And so I think it's anything that's within the uh, purview of the Nevada Department of Wildlife under their responsibility, anything that they would identify or uh, the board in conjunction with them would identify as projects. And um, in, in, in its current form, for instance, if I, as an as a energy developer, wanted to, I, I, I'm making impacts on the land, and I want to, um, not through a, a negotiation or a settlement, but through a, a, a donation, wanted to make some sort of an improvement to habitat. Let, let's say I wanted to improve sage-grouse um, um, habitat. I would have to identify the exact project. We'd have to go through that process of identifying the pro project and then funding that project, specifically um, uh, requesting that a particular project be funded, and then the endow would have to take that, turn that into some sort of a work program, and then take that to the legislature to see if we could approve that one 
project. I think what this is envisioned, at least from the industry partners, is it would be a, an, a, an account that's open and almost as an, an endowment that can grow where we're contributing money for the overall mission of habitat improvement and wildlife improvement in the entire state of Nevada for the experts at Endow and on the board for them to determine the best use of that, but within the, the responsibility that Endow currently has. I think that answers my question, but I'm not sure. Um, I'm concerned about the broad scope in here and how wide it is, uh, protection, everything else. And then also, as a follow-up, is uh, the federal government, and most of the habitat belongs to the feds. And so I guess that's got to be worked through with the department and how that goes. I guess you kind of answered my question. Thank you. Yeah. Chair P.K. O'Neill, for the record, to Assemblyman Gurr, I understand your concerns on it, but we do want to keep it broad, I think, because, so we can address several of the issues that our state is experiencing, that our wildlife is experiencing. And as uh, Assemblyman, or as Mr. Brooks said, to deal with the various issues as we grow uh, and maybe encroach out. Locally here, we have several issues, if you notice, with deer, and even bear coming down. We've had mountain lions actually down here in Carson City itself. And so this could help in taking some of that funding and putting up some of the better habitats and keeping our deer a little farther up the hill from us and not crossing over Carson Street and getting hit, et cetera. So some of the broadness, this is one time I agree with you that we need a broad statement to really address the issues instead of narrowing it down and becoming very specific uh, in our usage of these funds that are donated. Chris Brooks for the record, and, and even on federal lands in the state of Nevada, the Nevada Department of Wildlife has responsibilities for um, wildlife and habitat even on some of our federal lands. Assembly Member Brown May. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. So I have to say, first of all, insightful. Um, tried to do this on the HHS side. So I, I just want to make sure that I understand what you're attempting to do. It sounds like we're creating a contribution mechanism where we can accept funds from the general population that are not fees, right? Not, re not raising revenue, but making it voluntary to be able for them to invest in the areas that are important for them that we can then direct toward habitat maintenance and other projects but that we are a nonprofit entity so those contributions are then tax deductible through a 501c3 and can be utilized to draw down additional federal dollars do i have it yes pk o'neill for the record yes excellent okay i just wanted to make sure i like wrap my head around the whole thing we're going to draw additional federal dollars based on contributions of people who actually care about maintaining habitat without raising fees for Nevadans. Okay, I got it. Yes, again. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Okay, so I hope I never hear about accounts being swept again for the rest of my life, but is there any possibility of this account being swept? P.K. O'Neill, for the record. Uh, Chair, I got to tell you, I have a very sensitive spot about that myself on um, we do pay fees and the accounts are swept. Um, I think it would be best answered by legal. It's my understanding, though, this couldn't be because it's set up, although it's still an account that's within Endow, it's a special account on donations for specific purposes as designated here in NRS and would not be subject to that ability. Since there are no fees, it's donations, it would not be swept. And I'd be happy to put that as a amendment to the statute to make it very clear if legal says it's necessary. Uh, because it is a very sensitive point that uh, historically I've had issues with. So thank you, Chair, for bringing that forward. 
Uh, Chair, this is Chris Brooks for the record. In um, Section 3, Sub 5, um, it says that any interest income earned on money in the account after deducting any applicable charges may be credited to the account. Any money remaining in the account at the end of the fiscal year does not revert to the state general fund, and the balance of the account must be carried forward to the next fiscal year. So I'm hoping that that is enough clarity that it would keep, make this um, not eligible to be swept um, in a budget process. Okay. All right. We'll, um, I think, get an answer from legal at some point and just to double check because I'm, I'm talking about like when there's a financial emergency, not just in an ordinary course of those regular you know, yearly turnovers, but I do have a question from Assemblymember Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and this conversation just brought to mind uh, maybe a question or a comment. And thank you for being here. I, I'm intrigued by the um, the creativity of, of, of this and, and, and feel very um, optimistic. In regards to the sweep, um, and if we're going to have legal look into it, as I recall in 2011, um, because of the budget crisis, it seemed like there was a sweep that was done by the executive branch, but then the court had to intervene, and I think it was found to be not constitutional. So I'm not sure. Maybe it maybe history's not serving me right, but it would seem that maybe legal can check for us that maybe we have a precedence that that couldn't be done, but I'd like to be reminded if I'm right or wrong. <coughs> yeah, we'll get that answer, Assemblymember DeLong. So a little bit of history. Uh, back when that occurred, I was um, serving as chair of the Minerals Commission, and um, a number of the accounts of the Division of Minerals were swept. So a sweep did occur. But some accounts were swept. Other accounts weren't, depending on how they were established. L at least for the Division of Minerals. I can't speak to other divisions or departments. Chair, if I, if I may, P.K. O'Neill for the record. Uh, to Assemblywoman Hansen, f my experiences were both as a division chief, they all came from fees. When we had fees, we were putting money aside to uh, reinvest into our technology IT programs in the state, which at the, this was in early 2000 which we're in dire need and we're still working on today in the Department of Public Safety. Additionally, our motorcycle safety uh, fees, which were paid by those that have motorcycle endorsements, uh, were swept into the general fund and uh, damaged the motorcycle safety course. So it's my understanding, and once again, I'll acquiesce to legal naturally, um, it's the fees or the taxes paid, not contributions that come from various sources for these specific incidences. Okay, Assembly Member Gurr. That brings up a question in section one. It says money received by the department from the sale of licenses, fees described in NRS 278-337, and fees pursu pursuant and remittances. Does that mean that you will be collecting fees from the sale of tags and license fees in Nevada? Because then it could be swept. They swept the real estate division too in 2011. Chris Brooks for the record. I think that this is, uh, if you go to section F where it adds the Nevada wildlife, um, section one um, sub, sub F where it adds the, um, the Nevada Conservation Program account to that list of revenue sources that then get deposited into this with the state treasurer for the credit to the wildlife account. So I think it has fees, remittance, appropriations, and then um, additionally all other sources. So I think each one of those sources would be treated separately based upon the type of revenue that they are. But what they do have in common under section one is where they end up. And that's where they end up in must be deposited with the state treasurer for credit to the um, wildlife account in the general fund. So it does go into the general fund. This, the Nevada Wildlife Conservation account is added to that list of, of accounts. Okay, and, and Chair, if I might, is this gonna collect fees from license sales? 
Chair P.K. O'Neill, for the record to you and through you to Assemblyman Gurr, if you look, we're only adding what's in a, the bold italicized there included in there. So, and then it goes down to where they will be. So it's not from sales of hunting licenses, duck tags, et cetera. It's just the addition of this and that it'll be a line item or budget item within the state account. Okay, thank you. Just a little confusing. I never. Okay, we've got last question from Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I really didn't even have any questions until I heard the conversations. Um, based on my colleague Assemblyman Gurr's um, question about state general fund, I just want to make sure I took my notes right because I pride myself on my notes. I had put down when you were going over, Mr. Uh, I mean, um, uh, Assemblyman O'Neill, the section. You had said section one. Conforming change to provide for money received by NDOW is not required to be deposited in the general fund. Is that because now these donations are part of this conservation fund, so they don't go to the to the general fund? They're essentially, in my lay terms, it seems like they're exempt because it's a, this fund. P.K. O'Neill, for the record, chair to you and through to Assemblywoman Hansen. Um, I have my notes, I'll reread. Section one makes a conforming change to provide that money received by Nevada's Department of Wildlife for the Nevada Wildlife Conservation Program account is not required to be deposited in the wildlife account in the state general fund. Okay, thank you for clarifying. I skipped, I missed a word, thank you. You had me nervous. <laughs> I'm sorry, no, you got it right, I missed a word, thanks. Okay, so with that, I think we're going to move on to support. So go ahead and we'll have people start to fill in the chairs in Carson City. And as someone uh, vacates a chair, just go ahead and fill it in. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, for the record, my name is Kyle Davis. Today, on behalf of the Coalition for Nevada's Wildlife, we're happy to be here today in uh, support of AB 349. Appreciate uh, Assemblyman O'Neill for bringing the bill forward. Um, many uh, sportsmen's organizations that we work with uh, give millions of dollars and thousands of man hours uh, to the Department of Wildlife to support our wildlife resources. And certainly, our organizations are uh, many times the first that are called in times of emergency like you've heard about today. So anything we can do that's going to make that process a little bit easier and be able to get that money on the ground faster to help our wildlife resources, we're certainly going to be in support of. Thank you. For the record, I'm Pam Harrington with Trout Unlimited. Madam Chair and members of the committee, uh, to you supports AB 349. And I have to say, in my career, I've had challenges trying to cobble together lots of money to get a project done. And anything that will streamline, reduce the red tape, where you can get the stars to align, we're all for it. So I hope that Endow can push this forward and do a great job for all of us, and particularly that Section 1 provision that allows them to hold these monies in the Wildlife Conservation Program account, that's brilliant. I mean, it allows them to be nimble because with all these other deadlines you have to get this money together to leverage, and you're not doing your job if you don't leverage the money. It's just the way it is. So we're supportive, and I appreciate all the work you guys do for us. Thank you. Hello, Will Adler, uh, for the record, representing Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe today. Uh, Pyramid Lake would like to be in full support of uh, AB 349, as uh, to date, there's been many cooperative projects between the state and tribal nations to get uh, additional guzzler projects and bighorn sheeps reintroduced to ranges. Uh, and I think having additional funds and additional avenues to receive those funds and additional flexibility to have Nevada not miss out on any of those funds is key for going forward uh, with the best mind uh, possible to try and, you know, fix as many problems as possible. So I want to thank uh, some of them, P.K. O'Neill, for bringing this forward, and uh, please support AB 349. Karen Boger 
for the record, B-O-E-G-E-R, representing Nevada Chapter of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, uh, Chair Cohen and Natural Resource Committee members. Uh, Nevada BHA urges you to support this bill establishing the Nevada Wildlife Conservation Program as initially uh, worded. I'll speak to the amendment after, after this. Um, the act provides a needed structure for endowed to accept large size gifts, grants, endowments, along with the flexibility for those monies to contribute directly through endowed to purposeful projects. So that seems to me efficient, effective, saving time and costs. The Dream Tag has already provided a precedence for governance of the program. Uh, the benefits of this program to our wildlife and habitat are both statewide and diverse, and so there's nothing to be lost there. Uh, but as Pam mentioned, the essential key to the function and flexibility of the program is that Section 1 provision that the monies that are received by Endow for the program account are not required to be deposited in the wildlife account in the general fund. Um, in its original language, uh, creating this bipartisan uh, dedicated conservation funding mechanism would be one of the most positive, visionary, practical actions you could take this session, in our opinion, and we urge you to do so. Um, as to the amendment, honestly, I just had, since I don't have my board here, um, and we would really like the opportunity to talk to our endow um, um, people that we seek their opinions on, um, to see just how they feel about that, because I can see pluses and minuses to this amendment. I mean, it, as is, it seems like it's, it's maybe more bipartisan, simplified, makes it maybe easier to get decisions done. So um, we're remaining neutral on the amendment language. Thank you very much for this opportunity. So Ms. Bogar, under the community rules, I'm gonna put you down as opposition because, well, no, 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 it's under the community, under the committee rules, it's okay. Uh, just because if you're not completely in agreement with the bill as presented, it, it's, you know, it's technically opposition, but it will certainly reflect that you are greatly in support of the concept and are just have, going back to your board on the amendment and, and shooing over the amendment. Oh, so that wouldn't even be neutral. No, because neutrals, you're just providing information. All right, but and how fast so, can we get an actual decision back to you? <laughs> can well, we change I, I, that for the well, record? Well, I, I think it's, um, I, I think it doesn't necessarily matter because it will reflect that you're in great support of the concept. Okay. And and I just uh, recommend that you stay in touch with the bill sponsor. But if you do want to let the committee know when you're all 100% on board, okay. if you get there, feel free to let us know. Thank you. Thanks. I learned something every day, even with all this great. <laughs> Thank you. Please go ahead. Chair Cohen and members of the committee, my name is Jaina Moan and I'm the External Affairs Director for the Nature Conservancy in Nevada. The Nature Conservancy supports AB 349 to create Nevada Wildlife Conservation Program and an account in the General Fund. Nevada is one of the few Western states that lacks a dedicated conservation fund to support things like wildlife and wildlife habitat. The creation of such account is a good step to meeting a good first step to meeting the conservation needs for our state, especially as we see greater need for mitigation from energy and infrastructure development. Healthy ecosystems contribute to cleaner air and water. Nevada is fortunate to have rich biodiversity across our state. Restoring and maintaining habitat for Nevada's incredible wildlife is a good investment for our future. We thank the bill sponsors for bringing this forward, and we hope that you will support AB 349. Thank you so much for hearing our comment. Good afternoon, my name is Tina Nappy, and I don't know when I have been so excited to see a bill before you. My involvement primarily with non-game wildlife goes back to the 1960s when Nevada had the first endangered spe species bill passed in the nation and it was to really start reining in and knowing more about our non-game species. But there has been no way for somebody modest more modest like me, I'm not an energy provider, 
to really help support, say, even small studies of birds or something that's, that Audubon could give a little bit of money to or the Sierra Club. And if they had a project that they wanted to do, there has been absolutely, from my perspective, almost no way that we could contribute to the Department of Wildlife except by buying licenses. And since many of us are not hunters, that just really did not work for us. So this provides an avenue. And I, I mean, after 50 years of involvement, I can't tell you how excited I am about this whole aspect because it reaches out to smaller organizations, people who have more modest means, because Department of Wildlife could say, we're interested in doing a, a study on white-faced ibis. I'm very concerned about white-faced ibis. And we need some funds for this study. Are you willing to help? So I am in favor of this. Whether you have three or five people on the board, I'm all for it. Thank you so much. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Michael Flores the University of Nevada, Reno. I want to thank the bill sponsor and Mr. Brooks as well for bringing this forward. We had been working with Mr. Brooks uh, since last year on this concept, and our researchers and faculty are thrilled about the potential opportunities here. So we stand in full support of AB 349. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christy cabrera Georgeson here with the Nevada Conservation League in strong support. Our abundance of wildlife is what make our, makes our state unique and one of the most biodiverse in the country. Um, wildlife is also really crucial to our outdoor recreation economy. Um, so we're all for protecting them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Not seeing anyone in the rooms in Elko or Las Vegas BPS, please go to the phones. Chair, the line is open and working, but there are no callers at this time. Okay, we'll go to opposition in Carson City. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Patrick Donnelly with the Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, we are going to part ways with our conservation allies and oppose this legislation. While we've heard a lot about uh, generous gifts being made to the state to manage wildlife, this bill is about mitigating large-scale energy production and mining. Um, and that can entail millions of dollars in uh, mitigation fees. And uh, that, that money needs to be strategically deployed by the agencies to mitigate the impacts of the projects being mitigated. Uh, and so a, a political board should not be the ones making those decisions. Those decisions about the use of mitigation money should be left in the hands of scientists and wildlife managers. Um, so if this bill is going to create a mechanism for mitigating large-scale destruction from energy and mining projects, then there needs to be more structure put in place so that those decisions are made on a scientific basis basis and not by political appointees. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other opposition in Carson City, seeing no one in the room in Elko or Las Vegas, BPS, please go to the phones. Chair, there are no callers at this time. Okay, do we have anyone in neutral in Carson City? Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Cohen and committee members. I am Jordan Goshert, Deputy Director of the Nevada Department of Wildlife for the record. I am here today to testify in neutral for the Department of Wildlife. While the department does have the ability to collect donations through the Wildlife Trust Fund, large amounts of money dedicated to multiple projects over multiple years would be handled more efficiently through a conservation program as established by this bill, AB 349. This program is organized exclusively for charitable donations and endowments. The existing Wildlife Trust Fund account is used for dedicated purposes where the contributor will define specific projects they want their contribution to go towards. This program will allow a donor to donate funds for the broad purpose of preserving, protecting, managing, and restoring wildlife and wildlife habitats. The board of the Nevada Wildlife Conservation Program created by this bill will then decide the purpose of the funding that is granted to the Nevada Department of Wildlife. Having a board allocate the funding separate from the department will help bring diverse perspectives and management over the funding. This program will be a charitable fund administered by an organization such as the Community Foundation of Northern Nevada, exempt from taxation purposes, that is able to receive anonymous donations and is organized to provide support to the department in its effort to preserve, protect, manage, and restore the natural resources of Nevada. 
The Department of Wildlife has a long-standing working relationship with the Community Foundation of Northern Nevada through the Dream Tag program. Grants from the program that are distributed to the department will enhance its ability to more timely react to threats or impacts to natural resources while also providing required match to federal grant funding. The department sees this program as being able to provide a steady source of non-federal funding to the agency over time. Other states have used programs like this to meet their federal match requirement. Revenue sources, such as proposed in this bill, could help the department keep license fees for hunting, fishing, and boating affordable so families can easily enjoy Nevada's great outdoors. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no one else in Carson City and no one in Elko or Las Vegas, BPS, please go to the phones for neutral. Chair, there are no callers at this time. Okay, with that, I will invite the presenters back up for any closing statements. For the record, P.K. O'Neill, Chair, looking at the time, I'm standing between us and dinner, so I will try to make this very quick. I want to thank you all for this time and for the consideration on this bill. I think you heard enough from us and also from those in support on the value this bill brings to you and brings to our constituents in the state of Nevada today, tomorrow, and for years to come. I do want to say one thing. The one part about nimbleness of this is what we all look for. Government has been known for years to be a stagnant forever, taking time to get something done. And for some of that is for good reason that we study and, and really review projects. But some of these, when we talk about wildlife needs, they have to be done in a quick and efficient manner. This bill will provide for that ability. For the comment about this bill will stifle mining and some of our economic growth, I will stand on my record and say to you that would be the last thing I would ever bring forward to you. Right now, when mining develops before they break ground, they have to talk about their mitigation once their mine has mined out. And that's part of the cost of doing business is there. They have it set aside with the Department of Mine or Division of Mining. So it, ha it will not affect any of the mitigation of, of those projects. This is a separate project to deal with specific issues that people have that want to be addressed for the good of our state. And with that, I will thank you all and uh, see you at dinner. Okay, with that, I will bring uh, the hearing on Assembly Bill 349 to a close, and we will go into public comment. Is there anyone in Carson City for public comment? <coughs> Please come forward, and you each have two minutes. Pam Harrington, for the record, Trout Unlimited, and I'll be way quicker than that. I just want to personally invite you to the Great Basin Brewery for our kickoff for the Nevada Sportsman Caucus, which is starting up again. Trout Unlimited is one of the sponsors. We're going to have some food and drink and conversation, so it'll be great to see you there, and thank you for all you do. And it starts in 15 minutes, a good way to celebrate getting through your Monday. Um, so we really hope to see you there and talk about the meaning of the caucus. I know that some of you in this room know very well um, what the caucus was when it was still functioning a number of sessions ago. So we'd really like to restart that. I think this is a great time. I think we can get a great group of people, and I hope many of you sitting right there are among those great group of people that will join the caucus. So Thank you. So two things. First, I think we'd love to go, but we're due back on floor in less than 15 minutes. Um, but we would very much rather be there than on floor, I think. I speak for the whole committee, I think, when I say that. Um, secondly, we need your name. Oh, I am sorry. Karen Boger, for the record, um, just speaking for myself. And, oh, well, actually for BHA too because we'll be there. Thank you so much. Yes. We'll and, and we probably will still be on floor, but because we're still mm. waiting for some bills. But um, well, but have a great time. <laughs> we'll try we'll try to stay there. Thank you, Ms. Pogar. Please go ahead. That sounds amazing. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name's Cecilia Domino. 
I recently graduated from Harvard University where I was a 2021 Sustainability Fellow. I've returned to live in my hometown, Las Vegas. I live in 8015 and I wanted to testify in support of Assembly Bill 313 regarding pit lakes. I'd like my comment to go on record for its meeting. Okay, and, and I'm sorry, but we don't testify in public comment about bills, but you could speak generally about issues before the committee. Is, so am I not, so my concern is that I want to make sure that 313 is heard, and I was just going to share why. Am I able to do that? Um, you can talk generally about the issue. Okay. That's pretty much what I do. Okay. So my point was that have you ever been at a park or public beach and you see a bunch of garbage left behind and you think, didn't anyone ever teach these slobs to clean up after themselves? Everyone else has to follow the rules and not litter. Like, what makes these people so entitled? As a Nevadan, I'm personally impacted by the pit lakes left behind by mining operations because I live in and am part of a complex ecosystem. We all are, so on all of our behalf, I urge the committee to support the backfilling of mines. Send the message that in Nevada, we aren't slobs. We know how to take care of nice things, and we expect that those who make a mess clean it up. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for returning to our state. Okay, do we, I don't see anyone in Elko. I don't see anyone in Las Vegas. Uh, BPS, if you could please go to the phones. Chair, there are no callers at this time. Okay, any comments from committee? Seeing none with that, we are going to go into recess. And uh, again, we are due on the floor in about 12 minutes. Thank you.